Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming um, to ICT. Uh, uh, this is part of our, you know, uh, almost over a year ago now, we've had these series of lectures bringing um, Chinese and Tibetan speakers together. And today, we, our lecture is on the implications of the Gongmeng report on Tibet. Um, we have some distinguished um, guest uh, speakers today. Unfortunately, Mr. Tom Pinzola uh, uh, from the Office of Tibet is a little unwell and couldn't make the trip down to DC, so we'll be missing him today. Um, but um, I won't go too much detail. Um, the Gomeng Report um, is a bold new report released in May 2009 that challenges the official Chinese position on the causes of the protests that broke across um, Tibet in March of 2008. The report, which is based on field research conducted in the Tibet autonom autonomous region and Labrang Amdo also offers startling insights and analysis on the policies of the People's Republic of China in Tibet over the last 30 years. Until now, the report has appeared only online in Chinese and it's like unlikely to be disseminated publicly in China. Um, today's um, the report ICT has translated and um, uh, the document um, into English and um, our moderator for this evening, Ben, is um, the one who did all the translation, so, you know, a, a perfect um, um, person to do the moderating today. Ben is also a um, uh, senior um, research, uh, researcher at ICT. So um, before going into detail, I'd be happy to pass the uh, mic over to Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, we're extremely lucky today to have with Steve Marshall from the CECC. Um, for those who don't already know, Steve is a very prolific writer on Tibet. He's produced um, uh, numerous works on, 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 on the state of political imprisonment in Tibet in particular. Um, and Steve, Steve is noted for his incredible um, diligence, his, his, his surgeon's eye for details. Um, and he has set the standard, really, for anybody doing research into political imprisonment anywhere in the world, really. They, 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 I think Steve has really set the marker there. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Chen, Mr. Chen Po Kong. Um, uh, Mr. Chen was a student activist back in, back in Shanghai in the mid uh, to late um, 80s. He spent three years in prison in the early 90s and was imprisoned again in the mid-90s for his political beliefs. Since then, his, he too had become a very, political, uh, a very proli uh, prolific writer on issues of uh, politics and economics within China and also on, uh, on China-Tibet relations. The way I hope we can run this um, discussion today is to ask both panelists just to give a short presentation, three, four minutes, on their ideas, their thoughts on the Gongmeng report. The talk is entitled The Implications um, of the Report. And so we'd like to discuss really what, what happens from here. I mean, we're, we're talking about the genesis of this report, um, the people who wrote it, uh, the implications for what's happened within China, but then also, of course, how this report uh, will affect future policy making uh, and the future impact of, uh, of China's policies within Tibet. And throughout the course of the talk, I mean, once both panelists have presented their short introductions, please, if you have any questions at any time, make yourself known so somehow. It'd be good to introduce questions as they come to you, rather than have a discussion, then a short Q&A at the end. Please, please, if you have questions as we go along, please please make yourself known, and, and, we, and we can integrate those questions into the conversation. Um, so if I can turn over to Steve, perhaps you'd like to start, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, ben has uh, flattered me needlessly here, I think. Um, the OCI report, Open Constitution Initiative Report, the Gong Meng Report, I think is a fascinating document. Uh, it's a very complex document. I don't know if everyone in here has tried to read it per se. It's very difficult to do that. It's actually a, a number of documents that are all uh, intertwined. The, uh, the timing of it is very interesting. Obviously, it follows the events of March last year. But it also comes at a time when the Chinese government has elevated the Tibet issue to a so-called core issue, and they've announced their intention to put greater pressure on other governments in the world to more closely uh, <coughs> adhere to China's expectations in terms of policy on Tibet. So just as China is ramping up this, this new policy, this new international policy, a domestic NGO has released 
a very interesting and complex report that has uh, politely rejected the Chinese government's core premise about the March 2008 events, and that's that it's all the Dalai Lama's fault. The, the most important thing about the report is that simple, that they've stated that it is not these things, while they do acknowledge there was some influence by what they call the Dalai Lama and Tibetans in exile, that it was not um, a major part of what brought this about. They point straight to domestic policies. Uh, they, I think uh, what they, what I've got a quote here, they, they point to this. The research panel discovered that the 314 incident was caused by the confluence of many factors including psychological loss created by development, discontent among economic classes, the question of migrants, influences from abroad, religious sentiment, and unseen mass reactions which cannot simply be reduced to anti-splitist -split to violence. This is a very important observation. Uh, they're setting aside, in effect, most of the political issues and trying to look at the actual bricks and mortars of what makes Tibetans lives and what makes Tibetans lives uh, difficult in many cases. Uh, in order to look at this document, I tried to set up some notes that more or less physically represent the, the key uh, it, the key nature of the paper, which one, one aspect of the paper obviously wants to explain what the problem is for Tibetans, what are the issues here. The other one has to achieve the paper's main purpose, which is hopefully to be discussed and uh, taken seriously in at least some quarters of the Chinese government. This is a paper above all addressed to the Chinese government. Their, their language makes this very, very clear throughout the report. And in trying to be a paper that can be considered by the government. There are a great deal of language formulations, policy utterances, and so on that they have to use. So I've divided this into uh, a couple of uh, sets of features about the two Gongmeng reports, one of which is China-friendly and the other which is Tibet-friendly. And I'll just read down some bullet points first. This is the China-friendly Gongmeng report. It avoids uh, political and ideological issues uh, that are offensive to the government. It mentions the Dalai Lama only three times and does not refer at all to his status among Tibetans. It does not mention or express any support for the China Dalai Lama dialogue or the negotiations. It does not address or promote the key tenets of the Middle Way approach, which is the Dalai Lama's fundamental policy, as, as I'm sure everybody in here knows, toward resolving this issue. It treats the Tibetan problem as social, economic, cultural, religious, an issue of the, the value of being a Chinese citizen for Tibetans. It emphasizes the citizen status. The solutions it proposes all lie in education, employment, cultural and religious expression, and better governance. All of these, of course, on this list are things that are comprehensible to the Chinese government. Uh, it, it endorses the regional ethnic autonomy law as a success, and it focuses on improving existing legal structure and improving the function of the regional ethnic autonomy law. That is not something that the more, all of this list, of course, here is not something that the more uh, dedicated uh, advocates of human rights and political issues in China would welcome. The Tibet-friendly Gongmeng report, on the other, states that the influence of the Dalai Lama and Tibetans in exile were not the cause of the three so-called 314 incident. It states that domestic issues were the primary cause. I've just mentioned these. It avoids, as the Chinese document does, it avoids political and ideological issues that are offensive to Tibetans as well not just to type Chinese, but to Tibetans. It emphasizes respecting Tibetan status as citizens, which is a very loaded concept here. That means a lot. It refers to patriotism only four times, and not once in a manner that faults Tibetans in any respect. It points to the exploitation of the splitism label, and it faults officials who it describes as eat the food of anti-splitism. In other words, they exploit the issue of splitism in order to benefit themselves and strengthen their, their position. It identifies 
that group as a new aristocracy and in effect as one of the major problems. This is probably the newest feature of the report, that it's getting this issue of this self-interested, self-indulgent, uh, and what the Gong Mum report refers to as a corrupt group of people out into the open. That's very important. It acknowledges the regional ethnic autonomy law as having some new problems and challenges that need to be faced. Very, very mild, but it's a very bold thing for a group of people sitting in Beijing to say. It identifies the inadequate role of Tibetan language as the key to the loss of nationality, history, and culture. And that last point, focusing on language as the, the key to the, this loss, is exactly the same thing that the, the Dalai Lama's invoice, the memo on genuine autonomy said. It says language is the key. So you have two different documents, but yet they're woven together, and it's very complex. Should I stop, or should, can I say something else? <laughs> OK. So summing all that up, does the document matter? Yes, it places responsibility for Tibetan resentment principally on failed government policy. This is really important. Even if it doesn't change anything right now, it's a very important observation. Above all, what it is is a practical document. That's what people do when they're really trying to solve problems, is be practical. This is not an idealistic, uh, wishful document. And it's the way it is because it has to address the Chinese government, which is not going to be receptive to this. What it does is stay within this legal analytical policy realm that already exists. That's a very confining area in terms of many of the Tibetan problems, to put it mildly. But it is an area in, in which OCI, Gongmeng, believes and hopes that eventually they can make some progress with the Chinese government. It doesn't stray into political or ideological areas on either side, which takes a lot of restraint. It's disappointing to Tibetans, no doubt, uh, in a number of ways, but it's also going to be disappointing to the Chinese government and party as well. And the, for the writers, that's a big risk, but they took the risk. Um, will this result in a success? Um, not any time soon, but cumulatively, steps like this change the <coughs> dynamic. Ultimately, the Chinese government has to take this seriously. Ultimately, Chinese people have to start thinking about this and singing it in a way differently than they do now. And a document like this can make a very significant contribution over a period of time to shaping that dialogue. So I think it's important. Thank, thank you. Um, and as I said at the beginning, please bear in mind, keep in mind any questions that you have, and then once uh, Mr. Chen has, has delivered his statement, then we can integrate your questions into any discussion that we have. So, Mr. Chen. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's my honor to be here to uh, share my ideas, uh, thoughts about this kind of report. I, I feel this is an interesting report. This report is from inside of China from inside of the regime, of the uh, CCP regime. You know, in China, there's some, even though the government is very, uh, is dictatorship, you know, dictator, uh, they control everything tightly. However, sometimes they, uh, they may set up a group to research something, and they want to hear the truth. But that truth only, you know, uh, use inside, use inside, not outside. So this kind of, uh, judging from the tone of this uh, report, of the language, I feel like this report is not only academic report of the university. Uh, Gonga told me uh, this group, Gongmeng Report Center, uh, is composed by a group of Beijing University graduate students. But this report is not only uh, an academic one, it's a I think it's a internal reference material for the leadership of CCP. Uh, we call it Lei uh, Chan. They have a, you know, inside a magazine said Lei Chan, internal materials, internal uh, reference materials. So this is the first thing. Second thing, I, say, I feel like these uh, authors, this panel, this group, uh, who are behind them? 
I don't think there are officials behind this. I feel like there are some professors and the intellectuals behind this. And these professors and the intellectuals uh, know Tibet very well. They are sympathy with Tibetan people's situation. They, try, they are kind-hearted. They try to help Tibetan people. They want to say something true about Tibet. These people are nice, good people. And uh, in China, there is a way said um, under the red flag, oppose the red flag. Means if you want to say something about the truth, you have to use some smoke. The title of this uh, report is uh, something like an investigative report into the social and the economic causes of the 314 incidents in Tibetan areas. Social and economic Chinese intellectuals or professors or students, usually they want to put something political or religious point under the framework, under the framework of eco economy or um, social, social uh, topics. This is a smoke. They cannot directly go to the political issue or uh, religious issue. So this is a you know, uh, general way of the contemporary uh, Chinese intellectuals uh, use. Uh, so under this way, they have, many, they have to use many uh, skills. On one hand, they try to say something true. On the other hand, they try to uh, use the, uh, the policy or uh, the, uh, the current uh, policy of, uh, or, or, or rule or law of the uh, uh, Chinese government. So they, they say something uh, very, so there is, uh, you know, inevitably there is some errors or mistakes. Something like they talk about the history of Tibet. They talk about the historical relation between China and Tibet. Or they, uh, they talk about the, uh, the relation between Tibet and other countries. This is totally wrong. I know that's a mistake. That's, uh, that's uh, wrong information. That's based on the propaganda of Chinese government. They have to say that. Okay, that's a condition, precondition they do this work. However, uh, uh, they have something behind this. They can say uh, something very uh, unusual. For example, they criticize the government about the policy uh, uh, deal with the, uh, the follow-up uh, after the you know, 314 incident. So they can sound something true. And also they criticized the local government, as uh, uh, Steve said. Uh, say the local officials, uh, they are corrupted. They use the excuse of uh, anti uh, speedist or speedism, right? To, to, to use their money or to, to, to consider their mistakes in their work. But you can see this point does not only apply for local officials. This point can also apply for the central government. The CCP central government uses this excuse, you know, anti. Uh, Separate, separatism to do that. So, uh, so this is uh, the, their skill. And also, I found out in this report, uh, they talked some problems in Tibet, but these problems not only exist in Tibet, also these problems exist in all over the China, like the gap between the poor and the rich, and the corruption, and the, uh, the gap between the city and the countryside. This is popular. This problem is not meaningful in this report. But some problems, some topics they mention here is especially, especially exist in Tibet. That's very meaningful. They talk about the religious, religious belief, talk about you know, Tibetan language, Tibetan culture, Tibetan history, and education for Tibetan you know, uh, history or culture or religions. This is very meaningful. So they use something uh, general uh, situation to cover the special uh, topic scene regarding Tibet. So, uh, so behind this smoke, you know, what's the intention of this uh, panel? I think on, on one hand, they, 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 they just complete a task, uh, maybe this task arranged by, by the university and uh, actually by the government. But on the other hand, they try to say something to help Tibetan people. You know, and uh, s something very clear, like they even talk about 
should should follow the really follow the regional ethic autonomous policy or laws of the government. I know uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama also you know emphasize this. So this is the same idea with uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama. So uh, that's very interesting. This is very interesting. Our Chinese people understand what's going on. But this doesn't mean after this report, the Chinese government will do, uh, will follow this report. But this report is, uh, they can, uh, they will read it, they listen, listen to it, they think about it, think about it. But finally, it depends on who is in power. The uh, left, the, le the extreme left person, or someone who is uh, open-minded, it depends on who is in, in the position. So if uh, someone who is uh, more open-minded in the you know, center of the power, you know, they may follow some suggestions or the recommendations here from this report. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chen. And just um, some background that perhaps I should have given earlier. This report was written by the Open Constitution Initiative um, in Beijing. This organization has been founded, it was, I think 2003 it was founded by uh, a group of lawyers who were trying to, uh, they were outraged by this scandal that swept China, a young graphic designer was beaten to death by police uh, in Guangzhou. He didn't have his um, identity papers with him, and so police were using um, legitimate powers that they had under the time to detain this guy and send him back to his hometown. He was beaten to death in detention when police were using these powers. And the lawyers uh, challenged the existence of the, of the statutes on Chinese law that allow police to take pe people in with no legal representation, uh, etc. And since then, this organization has um, challenged many of the sort of more egregious aspects of, 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 of Chinese law, often coming at it from a human rights angle. Um, and, and, I mean, and, and Tibet seems to have caught their attention now with, with, with this report. So in, and the, in the consequent debate, since this, the since the release of this report, there's been uh, a lot of discussion about what's the, what's the nature of this report. I mean, some, um, that, that, as, as Mr. Chen said, that the, that the history, that the, that the representation of Tibetan history in the, report, in the report is very skewed, um, but that appears to have been to protect the uh, uh, the writers yeah. of the report. They have to give a certain representation of Tibetan history if they're ever to get this um, uh, uh, this, this kind of thing published and accepted. Um, but then, as Steve was saying also, that, that, that it, 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 does, it does have, um, actually, another point I was going to make quickly before I get into that was, was that um, the writers are actually, they've come under a lot of attack um, on, uh, from the from the, from the, the, the angry youth, nationalist youth in China online, they've, they've come under some serious attack. And they've had to, uh, I understand that three of the writers have had to um, deny that they weren't uh, attacking the, fu the fundamental Chinese government premise that the protests were fermented and planned by the Dalai Lama. They were not downplaying that. They're, they're, they're denying that that wasn't the major cause, but they're saying there were other causes. That they're accused of, um, of, of, ne of negating the idea that the Dalai Lama started the, the, uh, the protests, and they, got in, in, they, they faced quite serious threats because of that. Um, are there any questions at the moment? Any observations uh, from the floor? At the moment. Okay. Um, some, so, as, as Steve was saying, this idea of the new aristocracy, this has been the, um, one of the headline notions of this report. I mean, Steve, is that something that, that, that you want to uh, comment any, 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 any further on? I mean, there, 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 was, there was some criticism that maybe, well, this is what the Chinese authorities always say when something goes wrong in Tibet, they blame the Tibetan officials and then therefore they can bring in more Chinese officials. I mean, is, this, is this something that you've... Um no, this is completely different. This, the, this is the senior leadership, uh, at least in the Tibet Autonomous Region. That's another thing. When Chinese officials or party, they, when they say Tibet, they're talking only about the Tibet Autonomous Region. And the report uh, tries very hard to discuss the, the Tibetan ethnic area of China as a whole. That's another thing that's bold. They don't come out and uh, slap anybody in the face with that, but it's very, very clear that they're not just talking about the Tibet Autonomous Region. The, these people who make their, as they call eating the food of, of uh, anti-splitism, 
these are the people closely aligned with the, the power structure. These are not uh, rogue outlaws. So what the report does is pointing at the key, the absolute key people in charge down there as being the ones who have a lot to lose if the status quo changes in the Tibetan areas. Uh, we, I'm sure everyone in here knows who Tseten Wangchuk is, who works at VOA, a senior uh, uh, analyst there. He spoke at one of our roundtables uh, on March 13th, and the main topic that he raised was this, what he called a self-interest group. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, the first time that this was really raised clearly in a public forum. And this, this is very, very important. I've known Seth Wangchuk for a long, long time. He's, he's a, an extraordinarily knowledgeable man. He was born and raised in Lhasa. Uh, educated in Beijing, did field research all over the Tibetan plateau, uh, fluent and fluent enough anyway in three languages. He's, he's got a, a great handle on things. And for years, he's been thinking about how important this is, is that the people that the Beijing leadership actually trust to run the affairs in these Tibetan areas are using it as in effect their own fiefdom. They're doing exactly what, in a, what the Chinese accuse the old Tibetan government of doing, is operating it as uh, an aristocracy. So this term, new aristocracy, that OCI uses is really, really loaded because the, the, the Chinese government tries to legitimize a lot of their policies in the Tibetan area by saying that they're different than this old aristocracy. But by saying that the replacement for that is just a new aristocracy, that obviously implies that things aren't as much better as the Chinese government would like to say they are. So I, I don't think that the, this is not a standard issue of corruption in which the government would go after corrupt officials. Sen Wangchuk said at our round table that there were tens of thousands of these people, tens of thousands. That, uh, transcript ought to be up uh, on our website very soon, by the way. It's been all checked out now. Tens of thousands of these people, they depend on this privilege, this ability to uh, exploit economic issues and so on for their livelihood. So it's a big thing. What does the government do about that? No idea. But getting it out in the open where obviously at first the government is going to dismiss every word of this. I mean, their policy is it with respect to Tibetan areas is that nothing could be better. Education is better than ever. Healthcare is better than ever. Income is better than ever. Everything is wonderful. The people are the masters of their own internal affairs. Just like the preamble of the regional ethnic autonomy says, it couldn't be better. Yet, the same government acknowledges this big problem of contradictions. This is the, the loaded term. I think they used that counted 29 times. They talk about contradictions in this document. This is when things collide. This is when things work so poorly, they don't just bump into each other. They contradict and there's a problem. That's what March 14th was in party jargon, a contradiction. And this is a big deal. And this, to say that a group of people entrusted by the central government to run this area have a big role in this contradiction is bold. So that's a long answer and it doesn't really address uh, the corruption issue, but this puts the central government on the spot. Even to start discussing these things is important. You can bet that in plenty of small rooms somewhere, at least lower and middle level officials are going to be talking about this. Gee, is there any legitimacies to it? And the fact that the drafters avoided going too far in any particular direction politically and ideolo ideologically makes it easier for them to raise some of these points. Ben mentioned history, for example. The, the, the remarks they made about history would be um, uh, disquieting, to put it in the mildest possible terms, to a Tibetan. But if you look at what the standard utterance is, Tibet has been part of China since the Yuan Dynasty. Genghis Khan was trying to unite the motherland. They stopped far short, literally, they'll say that. They stopped far short of that. They merely raised the 
history as an issue. And one of the recommendations they made is that the Chinese government give the Tibetans some space, basically, to have their own historical views and their own views of culture and so on. They didn't elaborate on that at all, but merely to say that there should be some flexibility on this issue is a big deal. You don't have to, of course, but if you wouldn't mind giving your name and your affiliation when you start. Thank you. Louisa Grieva, the National Endowment for Democracy. I have two questions. One is, I was actually at a gathering with Chinese people right around the time when this report was being released, and I apologize, I haven't read it, but they were saying there was not only local officials who eat this food, but rather including, I think the number was either 12 or 13 separate agencies that someone had counted up and saying these very agencies would have no budget and would not have all their staff slots if it were not for this great need to control, to struggle against splitism. And I wonder if that, where they might have gotten that idea. And then the second question has to do with Mr. Chen's talk, mentioning that research topics into difficult questions are sometimes assigned by government agencies to some researchers. And I thought there might be some confusion about that, so I wondered if any of you on the panel might want to say, is this a case where the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences or the State Council Research Office or any university, in fact, because of a government body wishing to have data, research, recommendations, ask somebody to do research, or is this, in fact, what I understood it to be, was a very unusual case of individuals, intellectuals, who saw a tremendous, whether it's a contradiction, a social problem, taking it upon themselves to do independent research and then publicly disseminating their entire comprehensive work product. And if it had been a government assignment, this would have been very, very different. You either would have told the truth and been circulated, as you had said, Mr. Chen, only inside government bodies, or a very highly edited version might have been released in perhaps an academic journal or a paper series. So I think those are two very different things, and I wonder if I have the wrong impression when I think that the Open Constitution Initiative was much more like a research product from a free society where individuals are free to research a public policy question and let the world see what they found. So that's two questions that we're interested to hear from you on, Mr. Chen. And I think the first one actually touches on what Steve was saying about corruption, the level of corruption within Tibet and how it's tolerated to the extent, as Luisa was saying, that as many as 13 agencies depend on fighting splitterism and this level of stagnation for their very existence. Is that something that you can comment on? And then also CAS's involvement, people like CAS, organizations like CAS, how are they commissioned? Are they trusted to go in and do the genuine research that's needed, obviously? I mean, how out of left field was a report like this? Okay. Yeah, thank you. I would like to answer your second question first. There are two possibilities. One, this is an academic report from the university. The other one is from the government, and the government sponsor financed this project to have some group to do. And the government do something, they can use the name of the university, so in case there's some problem. So I think, from my experience in China, this is more probably from the government. And actually, in China, there are many kind of such things. Yeah, this is an unusual report. This report should be labeled as a secret in the CCP. They have different class of secrets. So this is confidential. Okay. So this may be the third class of confidential secret. So unfortunately, this report gets released outside. I don't like the government that like to release this kind of report. So most probably, this report is from the government, from my experience. The reason is because when I lived in China before 1996, I saw and heard a lot of this kind of things, you know, 
uh, about the social situation, political situation, or or some region like Guangzhou or Shanghai or somewhere there is some situation maybe the government don't, don't know. Uh, the government wants some group to do some research, do some survey, to do an interview. But this interview or survey or research look like from some university or from some academic institute. But actually it's the government want to know the truth. But this group has no risk to be, to be put into jail or something because uh, there is a, some, uh, some kind of uh, some kind of agreement or something. Uh, you know, this is a, my gov the, uh, okay, I'm the government. I ask you guys to do this. Okay, I, I ask you to do this. That's no problem. You just uh, do it and tell me the truth. And we use insight as a reference material. So to, to discuss in the meeting or something. But it doesn't mean they will use this material or they will follow this material or follow this report. So I think it's from the government. And, uh, and also this report, you can see, they criticize the local government a lot. But this report does not criticize the central government. And this report also try to say some good words for the uh, general alliance of the central government. Uh, they just imply something. Only one about this 314 incident, the, the only, only one point they speak, you know, very frankly to criticize the central government. They said the mistakes or errors, you know, uh, uh, made by the central government uh, to deal with the follow up uh, of the 314 incidents. Only this part they speak frankly. But they, they didn't talk about, they don't talk about the the process of the 314 incident, or they don't want to talk about the, you know, something before that. Um, this is, this is, uh, another thing I want to take example. Um, in 1989, in Shanghai, there was a famous newspaper. The name is uh, World Economy Guide. Uh, yes. Yeah, World Economy Guide. World okay. Economic Herald. Huh? The you World Economic Herald. What do you say? The Herald, the World Economic Herald. Okay, okay, this is translation? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, I just uh, translated from Chinese, you know. Okay, so this newspaper under the title of Economy, however, this uh, newspaper, you know, reported a lot of things about politics, uh, compare different political systems, regimes all over the world, and discuss about the, uh, 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 the, the, the short shortcomings, the, the bad sense of the uh, current Chinese political regimes, and uh, and also they have some, they discuss the direction of Chinese political reform. That newspaper is a half official, you know, half official. At first, I think that newspaper was supported by maybe Hu Yaobang or Zhao Ziyang, you know, maybe you know, I guess. So finally, you know, that newspaper was closed by uh, Jiang Zemin. Uh, in Shanghai, in the process of democracy, this that newspaper played a big role in the 1989s democracy movement. You know, so uh, okay, this is my thing. Your your first question is about the corruption of the local government. Something. So many agencies, mm -hmm. not just locally, but also nationally. Yeah. Depend for their budget on the fight against separatism. Yeah. And Okay. First of all, corruption is very popular in uh, in China. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem in China, you know. And because there is no democracy, no freedom, no no freedom as a, as a media, and no independence of the uh, legislative. So so official corruption is a very uh, popular and general uh, topic in China. So Tibetan is a, Tibetan's uh, local officials corruption is part of the problem. However, I want to say one point. The central government and the Tibetan local government, they have some, um, I don't know if this word how to translate, mo qi, mo qi. Any Chinese can say? Tacit understanding. Huh? Tacit, what is it? Tacit understanding. Tacit understanding, okay. 
good. Your Chen is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's my colleague, Tori Reed, who just answered that. <laughs> okay, task understanding. This means the, the central government law, they use this money to the local government. They know the local government will you know, use this money in wrong way for their personal uh, benefit or personal interest. They know this, but they pretend they, didn't, they, 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 they don't know. Okay, you use this money, but you have to work hard to control the situation, the stability, or you know, the uh, um, something like development or something. The, the, you, you have to do your work. Okay, I know you are corruptive. If you listen to me, follow me, you can control the situation. That's fine. However, for the local officials, they also know, okay, they, they have tasks to, to hold the stability, to control the situation. But they have their, yeah, they, they have their personal interest or they want to use the money. And uh, so they use some excuse, like the anti uh, spiritism, spiritist, something. They use the excuse. And they also know the central government sometimes, many times, like to use this excuse. Not all the local officials. The central government like to use this excuse because they have no way to control the situation. They cannot give democracy there. They cannot give. Uh, freedom there. They cannot even give the real, you know, autonomy policy there. So they can only use this excuse, okay, anti uh, speedism, something like that. So only if, one situation, if the local officials, uh, they are corrupted, they know, only if the local officials don't listen to the central government, don't want to follow the central government, don't obey you know, the order of the central government, then, then the central government may use this corruption you know, to put, in, put you in jail. So this not only happening in Tibet. You, know, you can say it happening in Beijing, Shanghai, now in Kwantung province, again. This is the game, power struggle, game. So in Tibet, I think they use this game too. And uh, as you said, the uh, task agreement is something like this. I don't know if I answered your question. Your question is too complicated. <laughs> Could I add a comment on that? Okay. The I don't know anything about the 13 individual agencies who would be depending on the anti-splitist uh, cause for their budget. But as far as where it comes from, this comes from the top. Uh, this is a Communist Party uh, view, and it's a view at the very top of the Communist Party. The the most senior. Communist uh, Party official who works in any of the Tibetan areas proper would be Zhang Jing Li, the party secretary of the TAR, uh, who is believed to be fairly closely aligned with Hu Jintao. And he's the most uh, bitterly anti Dalai Lama, anti most things to do with Tibetans party secretary since 1992 to 2000 when Chen Kui Yen. Uh, set a lot of these terrible policies in motion that we're seeing right now. It is much easier if you have contradictions happening, problems, you know, something doesn't make status as a contradiction until it has an, a bad result. Before that, it's just a theoretical a discussion. So you need something to blame all these contradictions on. So if the party decides to attribute all these contradictions to the the Dalai Lama and the so-called Dalai clique, that gives them almost an unlimited license to uh, ask for money, to use resources, to uh, m manipulate policy. It almost bec becomes like a religion. It gets to be that to argue with the notion that splitism is legitimate would almost be like walking into a church and questioning or not whether there's a God. Uh, it takes on this kind of life, this kind of power, this kind of uh, ab above, above challenge status. So that, that's where it comes from. I mean, certainly in, in uh, all of the uh, Tibetan areas, I, I can't give you specifics here, but to, to say that something is necessary to carry on the, the uh, cause of anti-splitism, you're almost unassailable when you say that. And it, the other half of it is that you have a scapegoat. When something goes wrong, you can blame it on the, quote, Dalai clique. You can blame it with outside, inter uh, outside interference. And this is a very difficult position because, in fact, there are a lot of Tibetans living outside of China who have very strong beliefs on 
all of these issues. They would really like to see independence. They have marches, they stage demonstrations, they form NGOs. That this, this, this view and the organization of the view really does exist. The question is, how much influence and impact does it actually have on the ground in China? That's a different question in another debate. But if China wants to be able to hold something up and say, aha, there really is a splitist movement. There's an organization that really wants this to happen. They can do it. And nobody questions whether or not it's a legitimate accusation or a legitimate fear. And, I mean, the, the, the notion that as many as 13 agencies may be involved in, in, in sort of using the anti-splitist uh, uh, struggle as some kind of cash cow from this point central government, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, the party itself has three or four major offices, if not just the propaganda office. Then there's the um, United Front Work Department, which is fantastically funded. Uh, the police, etc., etc., etc. Yes, the, 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 there's any number of, uh, of agencies who, as Steve says, can cite this threat as, 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 as a reason um, to have added funding and, and resources. Um, it, it brings up an interesting question of, of how much is the Tibetan question a question of corruption within the party? I mean, it, 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 how much progress? One of the major recommendations in the report, which is, which is what, why, why we're here, is for far better supervision. Um, the trouble is that the, main, that the main body of supervision in, in China is, 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 is a party department, the party the, 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 who's watching the detectives, uh, uh, basically. So that, 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 that the supervision that, that is ongoing in Tibet to try and watch, to try and catch, to try and stall or stymie this corruption isn't effective in, in, in any way, shape or form, as, as, the, as the report um, pointed out. I have a question back here. Um, I would like to know uh, Steve's uh, opinion on this, whether or not the report was actually done with the blessings of the central government, as uh, Chen mentioned. This is for you. And uh, Chen, um, if you think the report was written with the blessings of the central government, what could have been their intention or the motivation uh, to give such blessings? Kelsang, could you, could you repeat that? Just one more time, I, it's yeah, I my ears. I would like to know your opinion, whether or not the report was written with the blessings of the central government or not. Well, <laughs> in terms of having an official letter of permission, please go ahead and do this, uh, certainly not. But there is no question that it's something that took this much work, this much planning, this much effort, this much communication. I don't think it would be remotely possible for this report to have been produced if the government was truly uh, wishing to stop it. So the follow-up question is, what could have been the motivation behind this, or intention at least? I, I don't want to speculate on that. There, there are so many motivations involved in this. First, you would have to imagine every single consequence that could possibly happen, which particular officials might benefit, which would be hurt. Very, very, very complex calculations on many different levels in many different places here. Uh, and it would be, I think, really speculative. Uh, the other thing to look at is the extraordinary level of self-restraint that the report drafters used. It, it's really amazing how... Uh, how careful they were not to step too far. So I don't know. It could be, you know, the most obvious uh, idea is that because this contradiction happened and there's all this evidence that there really are a lot of angry Tibetans out there, that indeed some type of, something needs to happen that gets this not to happen. And you could solve it with lots more PAP and lots more rules of reg regulations or you could look at what the report talks about. They look at a very, very narrow spectrum here, and it's religion, education, uh, economic opportunity, local self-governance. Th that kind of sums it up. And if you saw improvement in education, local opportunity, local governance, and a better opportunity for Tibetans to practice their religion the way they want to, would that make a difference to Tibetans? Of course it would. Would it be what every Tibetan would like to have? No. But the, I think the 
area in which they have pitched their argument is something that does not directly challenge the government and the government's legitimacy. Therefore, they may be prepared to at least have a backstage debate about this. But I have to say that's purely speculative. I think you have presented a very good question to say what's the purpose or motivation of the central government if they did this. You know, Chinese government, you know, they are evil. However, they are smart. That's why they can exist to today. I think they want to collect as more information as they can. They did this all the time. When I was an assistant professor in Zhongshan University in Guangzhou, 1980s, I even have some kind of this task, but not so secret. Something, you know, a little bit maybe confidential about research is on the lost part of Guangzhou province. There is some problem, social problems there, and we have a group, you know, do some research. I know they want to do this. They want to, they collect as more information as they can. However, they put information, you know, list of information there. They collect a lot of information there. But doesn't mean they want to use all the information or they want to resolve the problem. They just put it there. And sometimes they may use, sometimes they may not, or use part of them. This report, even though I said the truth is about the political part and the religious part. However, even the social part, economic part, and education part, it's very true. The problem, this report repeatedly say about the marginalization and deprivation of the Tibetan people feel like in the process of modernization or modification. So that's true. And also this report also repeatedly say in Tibet, the development, in the development of Tibet, Han people or non-local people, you know, made more profit, get more benefits from the development. And the local Tibetan people, you know, you know, not in the center of the benefit. So this is also true. And they also talk about the education problem, you know, basic, you know, education or vocational education for Tibetan people and Tibetan youth. Even though these problems cannot offend the central government. However, the central government may, you know, they can do this. They can do halfway for Tibetan issue. Maybe in the future, the central government cannot do anything about the political change, cannot do anything about the religious change, but they can do something in the economic part or education part or social part. So the policy so far from the central government to the Tibet, so far they use money to buy, to purchase the local officials or local elites, something like that. They put money, pour into money to Lhasa, okay, make Lhasa very modern, very different with other part of Tibet. This policy is the same like they used in Shanghai, Beijing, or Guangzhou, or something, somewhere. They use this policy to purchase, you know, the most important part of the people, of the citizens. They ignore most of other people. So they use these people to control the society, control the situation. So if the motivation, at least the motivation is they will think if they can do something in economy, education, social aspects to please Tibetan people. You know, that's at least they can do. But in the future, if they, you know, if the party, you know, has some problem or divide, maybe they can do more. But now I don't think so. I mean, to expand on that slightly, in terms of things that are missing from the report, I mean, as Steve was saying, there's only three mentions of the Dalai Lama in the report. I was only talking about the sort of the problem with education, et cetera. I mean, Steve, you were going to say that geographically, the report missed out Kham. Right, which is, I think, very important. And this slots into Kelsang's question, too, in terms of government willingness to have this report go forward. 
the, they're really, if you look at the traditional Tibetan ge geography and you think of Utsang Kham and Amdo, research took place in Lhasa, it took place in, in uh, Kanlo, Ganon, and Gansu, but nothing in Sichuan, for example. And in terms of cards, uh, Ganze Prefecture, it particularly, this is really, really interesting because this is the place that, almost by any measure, the most protesting happened, but the least rioting happened. And it, there, was, there was less violence in Ganze than anywhere else, but yet lots and lots of protesting. So the drafters might have said, well, we're looking for these violent contradictions. And they didn't have a lot of shop burning or rioting in Ganze, so we didn't go there. But if you look on a provincial level, it's in Sichuan province, and Ngaba Prefecture is right next door. Technically, it's part of Amdo, but on a modern map base, it's in the same province with, with Ganze. And there was rioting there, a lot of shop burning, uh, but nobody went there to do any research. Now, to me, that's like looking at a tripod that's missing one leg. So there's a, a big empty place in the research. I would interpret that as this is that in Sichuan you have a, a communist party environment that simply, and a police environment, a uh, security environment that simply did not tolerate this. My supposition, speculation would have to have been that the research team would like to have included something about this, but it's not there. So if somebody slammed the door is the way I see it. And that, by the way, if anybody digs into this report more generally, the empty places are really, really interesting. You can't really interpret anything without thinking about what's missing as, as well as what's there. And in terms of the skill and sophistication of something, it's what you decide to leave out that are often your most important decisions. And what, what the drafters did in that respect is, is very, very interesting. Uh, I also have a question about the intention of this report because I think um, the people that I think this report uh, there's a possibility that it is it was actually intended to uh, have this report released. So it, it might be that the Chinese uh, the central government wanted to blame on someone, and very likely the scapegoat would be someone like in the local governments especially in the lower rank, and they want to give people uh, implications so that, you know, Sichuan, Gansu, uh, whatever, Tibet, all of those people may be infected by this. So they are actually, um, there, there are factions within the Chinese government that they can just play around this game and then blame on the either educational or whatever problem. I think they, uh, this report, since it was written so carefully, it doesn't really seem to me like something they was intended for uh, as uh, a confidential report. I think it was intended to sort of like a threat and uh, it's like uh, a warning sign. So someone has to uh, be the scapegoat and it's only the question of who is going to be that. And I think um, who and uh, uh, I am not quite sure about the um, faction conflicts within the central government right now, but I think Hu Jintao is uh, sort of losing his power uh, on over Tibet on some sort because there is a conflict between the, um, the political and the military uh, high, uh, high level officials in China. So. You said the government may release uh, this uh, report uh, on purpose or intentionally. That's, that's a possibility, but this possibility is small. I think more if they want to release this, maybe part of the uh, central government's officials, uh, they want to do this. Uh, that's, that's maybe possible, uh, you know, a, a number of people of them. Actually, in Chinese government, I believe some people they really know the truth of Tibet. They really know what's going on in Tibet. You know, they, they really know the, what's, it, what's what Tibetan people think. So this group of people may try to do something help Tibetan people or Tibet. That's possible. 
they may, uh, you know, if they have some way, they may, you know, release this by, you know, uh, informal way, uh, in official way, you know, not official way to release this report to, to you know. And uh, I want to say one point here. After Deng Xiaoping, there is a low one in CCP is powerful enough to change any policy, including Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao. They are very weak leader, leaders. They have, they have limited power. I, I think if they want to change anything, policy, essential policy, not only for Tibet, but also for other parts, uh, other aspects of this country, they have big risk. And Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang's fate and their result is a lesson, big lesson. So because there's a low powerful person in this party and uh, the key member of the leadership, whoever they are, whatever they think, they have to be very cautious to, to control so-called stability to, to, keep, to uphold the current situation. So that they dare not to do anything, you know. So because the problem is that 20 years ago and 20 years later, now it's very different situations. 20 years ago, uh, the interest uh, between the interests of the local government or the central government may be different at some extent. And the interests interest of the different local government may be, may be different. Now the interest, the, because more corruption, more money, and more involvement of the uh, uh, money issues or interest or benefits, now they are connected together, you know, each other more and more. You know, this government, this local government to another local government, and the central government to the local government, they connected more and more tightly. It's very hard to to do something for them. For example, if they want to punish one official in a town, maybe they will offend the a senior official in the county. If they want to pu punish one official in the a county, maybe they offend one senior official in the province or city. If they want to punish the official of this city or province, this person behind this person may be someone in, in the central government, in the Zhongnan Hai. You know, this, this connection is so tightly, so I don't think they can do anything. It's an uh, interest, interest chain, interest chain from top to bottom, from here to there. So that's why my conclusion is uh, uh, this is not so possible. This is a small possibility released by the government. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, if, if the report was uh, addressed primarily toward the Chinese government, I'm wondering how it came to be that the uh, report was circulated internationally. And I don't mean why, but just how. What were the mechanics of it being released? Um, and related to that, um, if the report is uh, addressed toward the Chinese government, what practically do you see happening uh, in, in Beijing? Uh, does it just sort of sit there and percolate uh, among various low to mid-level bureaucrats until you know, the seventh or eighth generation? Does it just sort of die away? Uh, you know, what, what happens? Um, related to that, I've read, and I don't know how reliable it is, I've read that this report has been banned uh, from circulating in China. I mean, maybe that's an oversimplification, but you know, if the government is taking steps to actively block it uh, from spreading among officials, what, what do you see happening with this report, uh, if anything, going forward? Um, I'll, I'll take the first half of that question, if, if I may. Um, just the mechanics of how the report was disseminated. It was put on the o OCI website as a, as a Word doc, actually, that, um, that, that was linked from the home page down quite deep into the site. You could, you, could get, you, could, you could get it in Chinese, and it was translated by um, ICT. Um, so it, and I looked a couple of days ago, and it was still there. We, we, we heard that the um, site was down, then it was up again, but we think that was more to do with hacking than anything to do with any order from the central government. Um, dissemination with, within China of the, of the Chinese language version, I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure how many people have, have, have seen it. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it would have had some impact in Tibetan areas of the PRC. Um, and I'm sure there have actually been orders issued too about, about its content. It's, 
but it's impossible to know what they are. I'll, I'll turn over to Steve and Mr. Chen, if I may, to discuss the, 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 where it goes, what happens to it now, how it percolates up or down or across. Well, I, Mr. Chen would be better at speaking about what might happen to it. I think if there was a Tibetan language version of this, uh, it would be banned with uh, great vigor and dealt with uh, much more harshly. The fact of the matter is that of the 92% the majority uh, of China that is uh, Han, and of course nearly almost everyone in China speaks Chinese, and Tibetans are one half of a percent of China, most of the people in China are not very sympathetic with this issue. They're not very interested in this issue. And that makes this a fairly safe document in some way. So hanging it up in a place where someone's going to find it and push it around some more is not uh, a tremendous risk to the government because it's not something that's going to have a lot of interest and agitate the people. I think your, your comment about will it sit there and percolate uh, is the whole intent of, of OCI, Gongmeng, in this case, and, it, and how it percolates and in which directions the, the, the ripples go, that's very hard to predict. But it, this is planting a handful of seeds after other seeds have been planted. And it just, I think, shows somebody's wish that eventually somebody's going to do some more careful thinking about this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Steve said. Uh, said uh, this uh, uh, many Chinese people may uh, not pay attention to this report or has low interest in this report. Even myself, I was pushed by Gonga Zashi <laughs> to read this <laughs> report. You know, I but the Chinese language very interesting here. I, I, I do not often speak English uh, publicly. I so except my broken English. Uh, poor English, but I, I do, I am, I, I am good at writing in Chinese, so I can, I can tell from the tone of this report and the language, this is a very formal language uh, report, and a very academic report, and the tone of, especially you should pay attention to the tone, if you are, you know Chinese very well, this tone is really write something to present to senior leadership, conclusions, recommendations, and even the words inside, many paragraphs, they choose the words, something like suggestion, call for, we call for, because it's on, if it's only an academic report, they, they, they don't have to say, we call for what, 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 or we suggest what, what. They just uh, research, survey, and uh, interview and put it together and uh, make some conclusion, that's it. But they use many words like, we suggest, we call for, and uh, recommendations on what should do, and we, uh, especially after the 314, they said, uh, they suppose they, they put some expectation the government should do what, 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 So I think if you are really familiar with the Chinese language you know, issue, I, I think this report is really something, yeah, the, from some uh, students or professors or intellectuals present to the top leaders. Yeah. Yes, Steve would like to add. Sure. Are you yeah. done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I couldn't agree more with this. Yeah. And I'd like to point out that this, this type of formal, very formal language, it's, developed, it's addressed to the government, but also to the party. And that if, if, if you have a chance, if you don't look at anything else, read the nine recommendations. It won't take very long. And the first seven, uh, if you look at what they're asking people to do, this is directed straight at the government. But the last two get uh, even more interesting. Number eight, I'll read it for you, the, the first sentence. When upholding and propagandizing construction to the state of ethnic unity, propagandize the successes of reform and opening up, etc. This is addressing the party more than it's addressing the government itself. The first seven have to do with religion, economic development. The, the first one, the first words of the first recommendation, and this is normally what people, what people would put, what their most important thought is, says, earnestly listen to the voices of ordinary Tibetans. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And this is addressed straight to the people who have control over the lives of ordinary Tibetans. Now the last, the number nine, uh, 
article is almost addressed to the security establishment of China. And it says, when handling crisis situations, it must be first be discerned various things and explains three ways to divide up crisis situations. So this is certainly going from government into party and potentially almost in, not quite to military, but there is absolutely no question who this report is talking to if you read these nine recommendations. Maybe make some points for you, Steve. In China, in the Chinese Communist Party, in CCP, there is some source, some documents, they put the red stamp there, they call Hong Tou Wen Jian, red stamp documents. And they said this document can be read by which area. So that's possible if they, okay, if this report can only be read by in the center government area, like the stand committee or something. But sometimes they can also read it to the provisional level. Okay, provisional officials can read this. Or even they go more lower level to the county, cities level officials. So as Steve said, maybe some points to the party, not only to the top leaders. That's possible. You know, that's possible they use this in some area. You know, they depend on what's their intention or purpose or how soon or how later they want to take some action. Yeah. Hi. My question is, when these researchers, group of researchers went to Tibet, and I was wondering how, what steps they took to gather this very important information, and, you know, especially at a very critical and sensitive period when most of the population is very fearful, and where did they go, who did they ask, and how were they able to get this information? I think it's very easy. It's very easy to get this information. Yeah, they go to the Tibetan people. Like educational problem, nobody has risk, just say it. For social problem, they just say it. For the feeling of marginalization and deprivation, people just complain. You know, they can easily collect the information. Just for the part, only one sensitive part is for the corruption. Maybe it's hard for people to tell the truth. But this is also easy because this is so popular problems in all over the China, not only Tibet. So all this, I think it's easy for this panel to get information, to collect information. And even though Chinese people, you know, fear the government, fear, you know, the military or something. However, when you go to talk to the people, people usually, they dare to tell you the truth. They will tell you the truth. That's no problem. So this is the experience in China. So and, but you can say this panel try to avoid some sensitive issue like religious or political issue. So they are, maybe when they interview or they do survey or do research, they, if they have this kind of issue like religious or political, they listen, you know, they listen more listen more than, you know, talk more. So they put something here cautiously in case they are labeled by some, you know, labeled by some people, by some extreme left officials, something, yeah. I'd like to add a comment to that. I agree with Mr. Chen, but, and this is a very, very large but, you have to look at the information they gathered. I really take the point that if a Tibetan was discussing something with a group of Chinese academics who had come in in the middle of the biggest crackdown in years and years and years and decades, certainly there would be no easy flow of information. One of the most important aspects of this report is that it avoids just about everything that's truly sensitive, that barely touches the Dalai Lama. There's no suggestion that people said, what do you think Tibet should be part of China? How do you feel about the Dalai Lama? Anything that would get a Tibetan into trouble very, very quickly stayed out of this report. They stayed on economic policy, development policy, education policy, the types of things that people can discuss. I know this firsthand because since I've been a 
uh, congressional staffer, uh, had a few opportunities to travel to China officially and meet with, with quite a few uh, officials, Communist Party officials and government officials, police officials, academics, um, in all of the provincial level places where Tibetans live. And it's, people are very, very good at discussing things very, very carefully as long as they stay within certain parameters. But you can bet that, that just like the men asking the question uh, pointed out, that under, these, under the best of circumstances, it would have been very difficult for Tibetans to talk about a lot of things that are on their mind. And under the current system, I mean, situation, it would have been impossible. I don't know if anybody noticed this, but very recently, uh, who was it? Um, Jampa Punsog or Zhang Qingli or, or somebody wrote an article very recently uh, assuring, I know who it was, it was uh, Nima Tsering, the number two man in the TAR People's Congress, was addressing a group of uh, reporters in East Europe quite recently. And he informed them that Tibetans don't like the Dalai Lama and really he's not very popular amongst them and in fact Tibetan people really support the Communist Party. And that is what an official will say. But in, if, if you were to bring this up with a Tibetan, they couldn't possibly challenge that idea unless they were in a, a truly, truly safe environment. And, and this doing a research for this report would not qualify. That speaks to the skill of this report, in my opinion, because they knew uh, what was safe and what was not. And they weren't, I think, trying to start a debate where they could somehow get the ball rolling so that Tibetans could have everything they want. But I think they really would like to believe that they've done something that in some way will promote enough discussion that in these areas of education, religion, who's getting the economic opportunity, migration, which is quite a bold thing to bring up, that in those areas the government might finally understand that it's in the government's best interest to uh, provide Tibetans uh, a better deal in this. In this. Yunzhen, International Crisis Group. I have a simple question, and it's for the panelists and Ben as well. What do you think will be the policy implication of this report? Not just for China, but also for the United States and for our Tibetan government in India. Thank you. I, 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 first, I want to uh, put some point with uh, Steve talking some part of the Dalai Lama about this report. Uh, this, this panel for this report, there is a low necessity or low reason to attack Dalai Lama or curse Dalai Lama. Uh, so they uh, respect the Dalai Lama. They use uh, just the regular words. They don't say. They don't even say Dalai, as Chinese government always said uh, with their uh, propaganda machine. They say Dalai Lama. Uh, means uh, respect. I think they know uh, Tibetan people respect the Dalai Lama. Okay, this one I think. Uh, answer your question. I think uh, I think this report is uh, yeah yeah very important for uh, U.S. government and for the uh, international communities to consider the true situation of Tibet because this report is not from Tibetan people, not from the uh, uh, Tibetan refugee uh, you know uh, you know uh, exiled Tibetan people or not from the exiled uh, government, Tibetan government. It's from the inside of China, from y even inside the CCP, the regime, inside the government, this report. So this report, except the historic part, historic part I said it's uh, based on lie, based on lie, based on mistake, you know, based on the propaganda of the government. About the current situation, I think it's uh, almost true. It's uh, totally true, uh, almost totally true you know, about the social problem, education problem, uh, economic problem, and uh, development problem, and especially religious and political problems. So that means this will help U.S. government and the community, uh, uh, international communities or other organizations to understand the true situation in Tibet. I think this is a very important, yeah, very important material. 
Well, in terms of what U.S. policy is, that's something that the, the president and some very, very senior uh, figures in the administration did decide the policy that has been in place for quite some time now uh, in the administration and that, as far as I know, is uh, very, very widely supported in the Congress as well, is that the Chinese government should enter into serious negotiations, dialogue, discussion, and find a way through these discussions that I should say the Dalai Lama or his representatives to preserve and protect the, the Tibetan culture. This is what it all boils down to, is the Tibetan culture. So I don't think, therefore, that th this document doesn't actually uh, put anything forward that would create a need to change that. What, this what the report does is address half of that policy, which is let's do something, let's find a way to protect the Tibetan religion, their culture, their language, their heritage. Let's protect this. And th the report discusses that in great deal. The report doesn't touch the part about the Dalai Lama, the middle way policy, dialogue, anything like that. But that's beside the point. I, d I don't think that, I don't know, and it's, it's not my business to know, but I'm, I don't think President Obama or Secretary Clinton or c congressional leadership is going to decide uh, that they want to move the Dalai Lama out of the picture. I think, it's, I think they believe that it's important for the Dalai Lama to be in the picture or they wouldn't be uh, continuing in quite a steady way with the policy that they have. But the, and again, the drafters of this report could not possibly have gone in to the area where they, in effect, as citizens of China sitting in Beijing, where the local police station is never very far away, to recommend to the government that they engage in negotiations with the Dalai Lama his rep or his representatives. That would have been uh, not only risky and almost impossible for them, but it would have undermined their argument that the most important thing that I think all of us are faced with is, is basically two questions. Can the Chinese government be persuaded to do something that is in the Tibetan people's best interest in this case? Is that possible? And if it is, what? And that's what all of these policy discussions center on. So anyway, I, I think that people in the U.S. administration and the Congress will find certain features about this very interesting because they too are a government. But it's not going to have, I doubt if it'll have any influence on, on the overall policy. Um, I, 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 okay, you may be question first. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, I, this, this report, of course, no doubt is um, really interesting and in, in many ways um, encouraging for Tibetans, but on the other hand, I, I didn't read the whole report, but just reading the summary, what I found very curious is um, the stress on Tibetan officials. The new aristocrats are Tibetan aristocrats. So to me, uh, it seemed like, so, you know, what this lady was saying, that there must be something else going on behind the scenes, some kind of internal, it, this could be a tool that, uh, who knows, you know, in Beijing, the, um, the politics and the intrigues that go on to, for like an internal tool, because the blame to me seems to be on the Tibetan officials. So the, the people who are uh, doing the, the uh, misdeeds are not, of course, certainly not the central government, but it may not even be the local Chinese officials, it's the Tibetan officials. So what is going on here? Should they remove the Tibetan officials because the Tibetans don't know how to behave? And should the Chinese come and take over and, and um, you know, uh, make everyone even more happy than they are? So, I mean, this is what's been going on in my mind. And as you said, um, Mr. Uh, Chen Pogong, that um, there is a reason for this. Uh, it isn't just some research. It's not, it's not like um, in this country where some research team might, uh, will, will, you know, find an interesting topic and really go out and do a research and, and publish it. I think there's a rhyme and a reason for it. And um, so I think the four Tibetans get too hopeful for uh, good results. So we, we need to kind of look at 
you know, and, and think a little bit more about um, some of the things that you two have been saying, but also, you know, what is really going on here? I mean, I mean that, that's a, a major feature of the, port, of the report throughout. I mean, what, what, what is being implied as opposed to what is being said and then taking into consideration what's missing. The report itself is really frustrating when you're reading it. What actually is it saying? That there, there are certain very explicit messages that you, get, that you get from it, but so much more of it is, 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 is tacit. You, 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 you have to fill in the gaps yourself from, from, from what you know or you hope you know um, uh, 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 about what's happening in China. And it's interesting that the Tibetan officials are blamed. Chinese policy is blamed, but there's no mention in the report of the fact that there's never been really a senior Tibetan of any genuine authority within within mm. within Tibet. Are you, are, are you um, sure they don't mention that? I, I, I do believe. Uh, well, no, there hasn't been a top official, but I think somewhere in the report, buried down in that 50 pages or so, they do mention that. Okay. Mention what? I thought they. I thought somewhere they mentioned that. There, there had been well, for example, the officials they point to are Tibet. You know, the top figure in the, the local government, for example, is always Tibetan. That's the constitution requires that. Mm -hmm. The top figure in the the party committee so far has never been Tibetan. But the people who are being pointed at as this uh, new aristocracy, which is largely Tibetan, as, as the lady's pointing out, um, they, none of them are the top officials, but they're all either from number two and anywhere on down. And the, I think the point is, I don't think there's any conspiracy in Beijing involved. And that Beijing tolerates this. You know, Beijing isn't going to change anything until they see a, a reason to change it. And documents like this report, discussions like this could happen that could, could help bring that about. They don't need to go in and, and uh, remove uh, tens of thousands of people, as Seton Wongchuk referred to at our round table, they could go through and uh, do a uh, kill a chicken to frighten the monkeys thing and, and fire two or three uh, party officials and everybody would get the message and, and things would change. But the, the key point here is not really so, the, the, that the aristocracy, this, this is aristocracy with quotes around it. These aren't literally uh, people who used to be part of the aristocracy, for example, and then were um, purged and then have come back to power. There are, in fact, some people like that in Lhasa, but, but now everybody's united by privilege above all else. And, and the, pow the power of privilege comes from the party. And that is, that's the point. I don't think there's any conspiracy in this. It's a, it's, it's a position of convenience and privilege, so people want to be in that position. And if the party in, in Beijing decides that this is a liability, they'll do something about that. Now, there has been a fair amount, I, I believe, from little things people are saying of Jiang Qingli, who's the party secretary there. Now, he's Han, he's not Tibetan, but he is a, an ardent supporter of all of these key Tibetan figures who, who are intensely hostile to the Dalai Lama and are as they say, eating the food of anti-splitism. So were, for example, Jiang Qingli to sufficiently embarrass the government of Beijing by his very, very harsh policies and some of his uh, spectacularly insulting remarks to the Dalai Lama, if they decided to demote him, that would send a, a real earthquake through the lo local power structure. So watch for something like that. You know, one or two personnel changes could make a difference. Nima Sering, who's the number two in the People's Congress right now. Normally, you don't hear from the number two in the People's Congress. You hear, you hear from the number one, who's Leg Chalk. But we haven't been hearing so much from Leg Chalk lately, and instead we've been hearing quite a bit from Nima Sering, and this really tough language. That might mean something. Now, if, if it turns out that his message wasn't panning out well for the party, maybe he wouldn't be promoted. But anyway, you don't have to change 10,000 people in a situation like this. You might have to change five. Mm. Uh, even though this report uh, does not uh, mention about the uh, very sensitive issue like uh, if the Tibet is part of China or uh, it doesn't mention about the middle way of uh, uh, Dalai Lama. Even though, however, this uh, report still implied something related 
for example, uh, this report said uh, uh, the central government used some way to deal with Tibet or Tibetan people should also use the religious approach to something. Uh, so this report said um, religion and uh, modernization can be hand in hand, not really a contradiction. And also said the uh, secularization, the word secularization, secularization, you know, um, is not good, you know. Secularis extremely secularization is no good, you know, they, they mentioned this here. And, uh, and even the tone, I said, even the tone, they uh, call Dalai Lama, implied something, implied um, the central government should respect Dalai Lama more and respect the Tibetan's religion, religion belief, religious belief, and, uh, and uh, don't use the opposite way to fight with the Tibetan's religion. And uh, they even call for uh, the education of the Tibetan his historic and language, something. So uh, this report, you know, uh, does imply some sensitive issue that's uh, also important. But I want to say is that don't put, uh, as this lady uh, said, uh, maybe something behind. I think, I suggest, or uh, don't think too much about this report. Actually, in China, in CCP, there are many kind of reports like this. Only this time is about Tibet. So you are very, you know, encouraging or very happy, Tassi. Don't think too much. That's, uh, that's too much, too, too many such kind of reports in China. Uh, Hello, it's regarding Falun Gong, regarding Chinese dissidents, regarding US policy, foreign policy, many, many kind of such kind of reports. And uh, the government uh, asked some university or academic agencies to do this kind of report. And they said, you can tell us the truth. OK, no problem. You can, you can say the truth. And they even send the journalists or spies go outside to collect this kind of information. So on one hand, I, 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 from their propaganda machines, they always say something, you know, nice or something they have to say or curse words or, you know, bad words, whatever they say, you know, they usually say in newspaper, in a, uh, on TV, uh, radio or something. But inside, close the door, they can have some kind of, you know, report like this about the truth. It doesn't matter. So don't think too much. I don't think there is a big change behind this report. It, it takes time. Yeah, we will see. But to the extent you do think about this report, <laughs> <laughs> think about how difficult it was for them to put this together. I mean, the yeah, biggest yeah. lesson we can learn is how they managed to select certain threads, how to leave out certain threads, and to weave together something that can, at the same time, possibly appeal to the Chinese government and yet possibly appeal to the Tibetans. If we want to try to understand what kind of challenges that people in China face when they try to promote a discussion like this, it's good to think about this document. Yeah, I think what you should think is that there are many Chinese people actually they want to help you, help Tibet, help Tibetan people. They are friends of Tibetan people. So as soon as the, 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 the whole, whole political situation changed in China, uh, I think Chinese people will really, really want to treat Tibetan people as brothers and sisters. They love Tibetan, love Tibetan people. This group is, is one of those you know, people uh, who are really same for same with Tibetan people. I think that's an excellent note to close um, this evening's discussion. Thank you both very much indeed for coming on, Mr. Chen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think uh, we'll have lots to talk about. Our speakers will be here. We have some wine and uh, some cheese um, there. So please continue your discussions as we will. Um, we have videotaped this and hopefully we'll be able to put it up online so you can pass it around to others you know who haven't been able to come to